first, I'd like to thank Rowan and Raul for inviting me um, and for giving me the opportunity to speak to you. This time, not about issues that are very close to what I have been doing for the last 15 years, which is uh, gender equality. Um, rather, today, I'm going to focus on unemployment and I will pick up and I will continue, as you will see, uh, what uh, the previous speakers have spoken about, only I will focus your attention and our discussion on the case of Greece. Okay, let me start with a little bit of uh, background. I'm sure that you are all reading uh, in the newspapers for a few years now, actually. Um, what has uh, happened in Europe's five countries, including Greece, uh, what I have in mind is Italy, Spain, Portugal, Ireland, and Greece. So um, let me let me begin um, with the with just three slides that will sum up um, uh, and give you what happened in Greece, and I will it will give you some background on before we begin with the issue of unemployment and how to handle unemployment today in Greece. So at the end of uh, 2009, beginning of 2010. Greece finds itself in a situation where the deficit, uh, the annual difference between the tax that are collected, the taxes that are collected, and the amount that the government spends, was uh, roughly 16%, uh, and the debt, accumulated debt, was 125% of GDP, and that was a violation actually of a treaty that all countries that belong to the Eurozone that are using the Euro um, had to sign on in order to become members of the Eurozone. And the Maastricht Treaty that they sign when they become members of the Eurozone says that their debt cannot exceed 60% of GDP and their annual deficit cannot be more than 3% of GDP. Um, so Greece was clearly in violation of that. Um, but I want to ask you to please uh, look at the three <laughs> arrows that I have here. As you see, the gap between the red and the blue lines, the red line being total expenditures and uh, the blue line total revenue, um, is there, but it is quite small. Before 2007, the last quarter, which is when the subprime mortgage crisis erupts in the United States and starts spreading itself throughout the world. Notice that between 2007, end of 2007 and 2008, there is a gap between the two that, of course, is um, difficult to sustain for a long time. But then, once you hit 2009, things deteriorate very rapidly in Greece. Total expenditures do not change much. The red line does not change much. It is a blue line that goes down. And what does that mean? That means you have a, an economy that is in recession. You have an economy that is producing less, is hiring less because of the crisis, and therefore there is less revenue that the government has. The gap between spending and revenue increases. It is in these circumstances in 2009 that Greece is not able to service its debt. It has a difficulty rolling over obligations that they had. Um, and therefore, that government that was elected back then in 2009, um, sorry about that, in 2009, um, decided that loans were to be taken out and guaranteed by the Troika, that is the European Commission, the European Central Bank, and the IMF. Now, I am uh, pretty sure that you all know that Latin America went through plenty of similar financial trouble in the 80s, and they had to also be rescued through these um, packages um, of funds that they would be receiving, and they had to sign memoranda of agreements in order to receive these loans 
And the whole idea back then, and exactly the same idea was applied in uh, Greece, but in other countries as well recently, is that if you're borrowing, the primary concern of the borrower is to ensure that you're going to be able to pay back. And in order to pay back, some supervisory board is going to make sure that your macroeconomic policies and the way that you run the economy is such that will allow you to have surplus, meaning you will be collecting more taxes than what you are spending in order to be able to make payments. But if we think about it for a minute, you can accomplish this through two different ways. One is if the economy grows fast and a lot, then your revenue will be plenty and you can spend for your local needs and have something left over to make payments to your debtors. The other way to do it is to slash spending, government spending. You may be receiving the same revenue. Now you don't spend it on basic needs. What do you do? Um, you reduce spending on health, education, transportation. You fire your public servants, literally. You reduce their wages by how much? 12%, 15%, 20%. Uh, pensions, you stop paying pensions. You reduce pensions by 30 or 40 percent. And at the same time, you increase taxation. You are going to end up with a primary surplus, with a surplus that will allow you to make payments, but in the meantime, you will have killed off the economy and its people. And this is exactly what is happening in Greece, and this is what I'm showing you on this third graph, on the second graph here, where you see government spending, disposable income, and consumption expenditures declining all, being in negative territory essentially, um, since 2010, I'm picking 2010 because this is when we sign the first bailout package. So Greece has now borrowed 250 billion in order to be able to roll over its debt and essentially all of what I described, which are the austerity measures and based on the idea that I mentioned earlier, that to the degree that you are cutting down, shrinking the government sector, less and less government spending will allow you to reach a healthy state for the economy. Of course, this is complete nonsense. And one of the things that happened is that I have three figures here. 2008, unemployed people in Greece were, mm, the unemployed in Greece were um, roughly 370,000. 2010, we are on the, during the second year of the crisis in Greece, before the IMF and the loans come in, and we have 640, that's a lot. But fast forward and give it two and a half more years, this is where this figure comes from, and you now have 1.3 million people unemployed. Greece is a small country, 10 million people. The employment that you were talking about earlier to the population um, ratio um, in 2008, let's say, was roughly 6%. Today it is 40%. And with 40% employment ratios, we have unemployment that has reached 27, 20, going to 28%. Just to complete this part of my presentation, um, what I have here is two graphs that are comparing the Greek situation with the Great Depression in the United States. Um, the graphs come from a paper um, prepared my, by my three colleagues at the Lib Institute. And the blue line represents Greece, and you can see that both the left-hand side graph that shows uh, GDP, gross national product, is declining and is declining and keeps declining. Four years into the Great Depression in the United States, you have a turnaround, not in Greece still going down. And when you look at the unemployment situation, same thing. The black line here shows the United States. There is a turn around in terms of unemployment plateauing out at 
and coming down. In Greece, as I have shown you already, it has been or it has crossed that 25 percent. It is now closer to 28 percent and rising. So. What are the issues now in Greece when we look at unemployment? The basic issue is that we continue to have, we continue to have a um, set of policies. The austerity that I was describing before, the shrinking of the government, decline, way slow, smaller, um, oh, sorry, um, reduced wages trying to become more competitive and export more that are simply not working. They are shrinking the economy, but they are not really getting us out of the recession. Now, Greece is in a peculiar situation. The United States is in a very different, and exists under very different circumstances because you have an autonomous currency. And for those of you that uh, have been participating in the various seminars of the modern money theory, you would immediately recognize what that means. Greece does not have a currency of its own, cannot issue a currency. You are part of the euro, and that means, for example, you cannot determine your own interest rates. You cannot uh, print money. You cannot issue bonds yourself. You have to have permission. And if the permission is not given, you cannot act. So. Signing the Mar Maastricht Treaty, as you recall, also takes away your ability to have expansionary fiscal policy. So during a recession, instead of the government being rightfully able to spend more in order to make up for the shrinking that takes place in the private sector, you cannot do that either. So you don't have fiscal policy, you don't have monetary policy, you don't have exchange rate policy. So what do you have? You don't have any policy instruments. Therefore, a lot of uh, folks have talked about the incomplete, the faulty architecture of the European Union and how this needs to change. I want to mention now one more flaw of the European Union. And if that is not addressed, we're not going to go anywhere in Europe. There is no employment target for any of the countries. In other words, the success or failure of a country and what country signed on pertains to whether you are keeping your tax revenue and your spending under control. It does not ask at all whether the economy is growing, increasing, and creating decent jobs. So the orientation that even in the United States, you know, the, cen the central bank here, the Federal Reserve Bank, at least has a dual mandate. <laughs> Whether it is working out or, or not to have quantitative easing after quantitative easing in terms of employment, that's a question, of course. But at least you have somebody at the central bank saying, we will continue this policy until unemployment rates come down 5%. In Europe, there is no policy, essentially, around employment. But what do we have in Europe? What we have in Europe is an antiquated, active labor market set of policies. Um, what do I mean by antiquated? Bob spoke about it a, a little bit earlier. If you begin with the idea that when you have unemployment, there is something wrong with the person that is unemployed. Meaning, the person that is supplying labor in the market has some kind of a deficit, educational deficit. So, how do you fight poverty? Educate them. If you educate them, they have good skills, they'll get in the market, they'll get the right wages, and they get employed. But, Professor Darity told us that that ain't necessarily so. <laughs> And I loved when you made the comparisons between white folks and black folks when it comes to different levels of education because I remember teaching gender and you get exactly the same picture up until the late 90s. Then some things changed. Huge, huge gaps that are inexplicable back then, presumably. So if the supply of labor is problematic, 
what do you do? You have to fix it. You have to fix the individual. You don't have to fix the market. You don't have to fix labor markets. You don't have to think about whether demand is sufficient to hire everybody. You fix labor. And who among the laborers was most vulnerable? In the opinion of the Europeans, the most vulnerable are the youth. They don't have any experience. Maybe they have a decent level of education, but if there is unemployment, we have to help them become employable and either educate them a little bit more or we have to allow them, give them a first chance with the company so the government policy in Sweden, in Finland, in Germany, in every single country in Europe has been focusing on two things when they speak about handling unemployment. One is increasing employability, the other is increasing the ability to be an entrepreneur. Anything wrong with that? No, it does apply to some people, absolutely. This is the story for a segment of the population, but not for everybody. And there are other issues that have to do with demand for labor. So in a situation like the one we are facing now in Greece, and what I have here is um, the unemployment rates. If you can look at the first column, this is 2008, and the next column shows you the unemployment in the second quarter of 2013. What you will observe, actually, if you were to look at all of these um, rates, is that every single country, except for Germany, has seen their unemployment increase, including, of course, you have the five countries that, are, that were really hard hit, um, Ireland, Greece, Spain, and so on. But what is important to notice is that there are countries such as Bulgaria, um, Latvia, that in terms of their finances and in terms of their ability to pay their external debt, they're doing fine. Actually, they have surpluses. This has not protected them from unemployment. Why? Because the reason you got unemployment was that you have markets in general shrinking and demand globally, global growth rates, of course, declining. While we have a problem with demand, and you get an unemployment of 27% in Greece because of lack of demand for labor, the remedy that is being offered is employability. So what do they do? They literally give stipends of the equivalent in the US would be $300 a month for someone to go to a training school for a month or two. And there are studies after studies that have shown that the employability actually doesn't last long. You get employed while the program lasts. <laughs> Once the program ends, nothing doing. One word about unemployment. I'm not sure why this is moving so fast. Okay, one word about um, youth unemployment, and then I will take the next three minutes to tell you what we're doing in Greece. Um, be careful, and I had, I'm addressing both my colleagues here in the room and everybody else. Youth unemployment is very high. Uh, in Greece, as was mentioned, actually today is 60%. So here you have youth unemployment, 15 to 24. In all of these countries, the red line. You can clearly see unemployment rates are much higher than unemployment for the rest of the population, aged, let's say, 25 to 64. But see what happens if I look at another ratio. This is the unemployment share by age. So in Greece I have today 1.3 million people unemployed. And what I'm asking here is how many among them are young? What is the share of the unemployed? In Greece it is 173,000. Out of 1.3 million people, it's 173,000 that are young. Do they not face a problem? Absolutely, yes. But here is the hypocrisy. In the last year, we had 
five meetings in Europe of leaders to see how they will respond to unemployment in Europe. And all they talked about was youth unemployment. And they came up with pitiful budgets to support projects like what I was talking about that will address increased unemployment for 173,000 and they will leave one million people without any response, essentially. So there is another kind of rhetoric there with youth unemployment that I think we have to be mindful of. Okay, so now I have to move very fast and tell you, um, I hope you will ask me some questions so I will whet your appetite about um, this, that I, about what I want to talk to you in the next, uh, three, in the rest of the, in the three minutes that I have. Um, okay, um, the Livy Economics Institute is famous for one person uh, for many people that have uh, been resident scholars, one of them was called Minsky, Hyman Minsky. He spoke about financial fragility, and that's where the Minsky moment comes from that you have all seen and heard. Um, but he also spoke about the employer of last resort policy, which is the stabilization policy that we heard about before, the automatic stabilizer. It is called a job guarantee, an employment guarantee, and I am very thankful again to my colleague, um, Professor Darity, uh, because he explained pretty much what it is. What I want to do in the next one minute, I guess, that I have, is to tell you that in 2010, um, the Libby Institute spoke with Luca Cacelli, who was the minister of, you remember Luca, uh, who was the minister of labor at the time, and they had not signed any agreements, any memoranda, but we were in a recession. So we spoke to Luca together with the trade unions because you need these kinds of agreements. And an agreement was reached in 2010 before the signing of the memoranda that an employment guarantee program was needed. And she said, we don't have a lot of money, but what we have left over for the year, we will start a program with 50,000 for 55,000 people. And they started it. And in terms of the design and how do you do that properly, um, some of us, including myself, I have worked in South Africa, in Mexico, in India, the, in programs that actually um, were talked about earlier, were mentioned at least earlier, and we had a little bit of experience. Anyway, we started this. Then what happens is austerity measures and the bailouts come in, they devastate the economy, they devastate, of course, labor markets, and they continue with the 50,000 a year. So we have said, of course, that one, the austerity has to stop. Secondly, a massive kind of reinvestment and reconstruction plan has to settle in, in Greece, otherwise we're not getting out of this situation. You have suicides, you have homelessness, you have phenomena that we never imagined we're going to see. Um, no water, no sanitation, no heat, literally. Um, and they are now looking into the opportunity that may exist that we are going to change the government, actually. That this government will fall because they keep insisting on the same policies and that a new, more enlightened and progressive government will um, uh, take over. What we have done here, therefore, as we are in conversation with various um, um, constituencies in Greece, is we have created a program for 250,000 or 550,000 jobs. We have costed it where 60% of the cost goes for wages, 40% goes for administration and materials because there are projects that are waiting to be done along the lines that you heard already, but including in the case of Greece, environmental, a lot of environmental uh, work that is um, waiting. And what you have in front of you is the macroeconomic implications of such programming. So let me just look at one cell. If you take a wage of 586 euros per month, 
and you hire in half a million people, 550,000 people. Because of the multiplier effects, you will generate more jobs in the economy. So the total number of jobs that you will generate actually is 700,000, 713. It costs a lot, let's say, 7 billion. Mind you, 7 billion a year is what we pay right now for interest payments only to the debt that belongs to third parties, other countries, essentially. So if we had a moratorium of just three years, we don't make payments for just three years, and we tie this amount of money to a job creation program, we could solve so many, many problems in Greece. So to finish up, although the cost is 7.1 billion, once you look at the tax revenue that it will generate, you end up with a cost of 3 billion. And with 3 billion a year, you can support full-time jobs for 700,000, meaning you would cut unemployment in half. This therefore becomes a, a, a reality. The reality that you, I'm talking about is an employment guarantee program serving precisely the role of a stabilization policy, an expansionary fiscal policy, only instead of investing in general and waiting until the jobs get created, you go the other way around. You target your spending, your public spending, directly on job creation. The last slide that I'm not going to go through because I've exhausted everybody's patience by now, um, describes for the case of Greece where would the money come from, which is always a question. Where will the money come from? We can find the money, actually. We don't have, and we have not found yet, the political will. And that is true for Greece, for the United States, and the hope is that eventually we will be able to build an international movement that commits to changing, in fact, constitutional rights the way they did it in India. Because that's what they did in India. They amended the constitution and the right to work movement that took 10 years to take root by now guarantees employment. Not full time, not forever, but for five months every year in rural areas where you have seasonal unemployment and now you have more than one third of the population participating year after year. If India can do it, please do not tell me the United States cannot. Thank you. Thank you.